We got a great guest for you guys. So joining me now is Lance Reddick. Uh, he is uh, an actor. He's also a composer. Uh, yes. Um, and I want to talk about that as well. Although I don't do a lot of that these days, but yeah. Yeah, but I find it interesting, so I want to uh, mention that. So um, he was in The Wire, Oz, uh, he's in Bosch uh, right now, John Wick, John Wick Chapter 2, uh, and the list goes on. If I read John his Wick, IMDb, three. what's that? Chapter 3 is coming out next month. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay, oh, I yeah. see that, there you go. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about how you got started. Uh, and then I want to show a clip of Bosch. There's a lot I want to do. Okay. Okay, so where'd you grow up, first of all? I grew up in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school in Rochester, uh, to college in Rochester, New York. Uh, first, I was at the University of Rochester my first year, and then I transferred to the Eastman School of Music. So, uh, did you like Baltimore? I think so. I mean, as a kid, I didn't really, I know a lot of people, I don't know why, but particularly New Yorkers seem to just love where they grew up. I wasn't particularly attached to it. Uh, uh -huh. I don't tend to miss it, but um, um, I think it's kind of a great place. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, and uh, why'd you go to University of Rochester? Um, interestingly enough, I applied to University of Rochester because Eastman School of Music was there. My first year, believe it or not, I was a physics major. Um, I, uh, I was always had kind of an affinity for math, but I grew up studying music. I started playing the piano when I was six, and I started writing songs when I was seven. Yeah, I, I know a lot of actors who are uh, also majored in physics. Oh, right, I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you dropped out, right, uh, to, to pursue music. Well, no, I transferred to Eastman. You transferred the, to Eastman. From the university, yeah. So my first year I was at the university, halfway through, I, I remember I went to a concert my, at, at, at the Eastman my first semester, and I just thought, you know what, this is where I belong. You know what I mean? Because uh -huh. even though I kind of love math and, <clears throat> and, and calculus and loved kind of the theoretical stuff, in a lab it was like, I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to be, a, be a, uh, an experimental physicist. Right. So and what, music was my kind of my heart. Yeah. What kind of music? Well, it's, it's, that's the other thing that's funny because I grew up studying classical music, but my real passion was pop music. But because of the culture that I grew up in, pop music was kind of considered not real music. That's fine. Yeah. Jazz yeah. was, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I, I've always argued that, um, it, to the great annoyance of many people, including many progressives, that L.A. is the uh, cultural hub of the world, and whether you like it or you don't, uh, we create culture here, and and it's spread out in, in throughout the world in our movies and uh, and in our TV shows, and, uh, and in fact, the most popular movie in uh, the history of Afghanistan is Rambo Three. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> wow. And so, uh, and so, I always thought that there was, and maybe you might disagree because you're into classical music. That there was there's too much focus on the dead arts uh, as opposed to the ones that are living and breathing right now. So back in the day, ballet was movies, opera was movies. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, well, when you say too much emphasis, do you mean by whom? No, no, you're right. Not not overall in in the media or anything like that. But in the in the art circle, in the art communities, right? They view it as like real art, real yes, culture. Yes, well, especially when I especially when I was growing up. Uh, uh, classical music, uh, there was a, I mean, by the time that I was getting to high school and junior high school, jazz had kind of become its own, it it, <clears throat> it, it it moved from being kind of the popular music in the 40s to once rock and roll hit, kind of kind of moving into its own kind of artist, artistic thing, especially as it got more avant-garde with bebop uh, and, and then with um, modern jazz in the 60s. Yeah, jazz is always considered uh, acceptable in the intellectual art community. I feel like, well, or, not, or maybe not, not always. First. Yeah, right, right, yeah. exactly. In the by time the period 50s, you're talking about, yeah, by the fifties, it started to become that. Yeah. yeah so, within uh, the classical world, what, what did you play an instrument? What did you do? I played piano. Uh, composition was my major at Eastman, so uh -huh. I wanted to be a classical composer. I mean, the the two composers that I was kind of obsessed with were Ravel and Beethoven. Okay. Wow. Um, so uh, okay, so you do that. How yeah. long did you do it for? And what? And and obviously you got rich off that, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> so I actually dropped out of music school after four after four years being in music school. And even in those four years, I took a year off. Uh, and um, but I stayed in Rochester um, working on jobs. And I, I dropped out because I realized that I was just in denial, and I really wanted to be a rock star. I didn't really want to be pop, a, a classical composer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got married, married straight out of school. Mm -hmm. And um, two years later, my daughter was born. And 
And the year after that, I found myself working three jobs seven days a week. <laughs> and acting is something that I had done for fun in college, and it was something I always knew that I was good at. But it was, it was the only thing in my life that I'd ever done just for fun. And honestly, I had a, I had a back injury uh, while, I was deli- it, while I was delivering newspapers. I'd come off a double shift of waiting tables straight to a double shift of delivering newspapers. And I used to deliver big, heavy bundles of the Wall Street Journal to the financial district in Boston, which is where I was living. Um, and, you know, while I was laid up, I just started reevaluating my approach. And I realized that, you know, if I keep doing this, I'm going to keep doing this. And I don't know why. I mean, I, to this day, I don't know what possessed me, but I just thought, well... I can sing and I can act. Let me try that. I went on two musical theater auditions. I was like, these people are singers. I just got a guy with a nice voice. And then I started going on straight acting auditions in local theater. And I just started getting cast and getting cast and getting cast. So I want to talk about that in a second. But I love that you're like the only guy in the country who's like, you know what? I need a more stable career, so I'm going to go into acting. Well, it's funny. <laughs> that's usually the response when they say that. But it wasn't even a, a, a matter of more stable. It was a matter of how do I make something happen? Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because as far as it m- more stable, there was nothing that I was ever going to do that was going to be more stable that I was qualified to do. So um, it was just an act of desperation. I mean, I, I don't, especially now in my life, as, as I've gotten more um, agnostic, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't uh, tend to subscribe to these kinds of things, but I re- it really felt like a moment of kind of divine intervention of guidance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it's best back injury in American history. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because two years later, I was at Yale School of Drama. And yeah. even that was kind of a weird. Yeah, how'd you get that? So I, I, I remember you dropping out something, apparently it was Eastman, right? Yeah. So then you yeah. go through this experience, and then you wind up at Yale. How, how in the world did that happen? So I was, uh, one, of the, one of the jobs that I could get that where there was lots of flexibility was working as an artist model. And being in Boston, there were lots of art schools. So um, if, if, if something came up last minute, you could just go down the roster and call up somebody to take one of your classes, you know? So um, there was, um, his name was Lou Gepetti. And he, uh, I, I had modeled for his, uh, a lot of his drawing classes for a couple of years. He started painting me privately. So one day we were uh, in his studio and I, <laughs> It's funny because I've seen this painting. He showed it to me uh, a couple years ago because I got back in touch with him on Facebook of all places. Um, but it was me, me in these green khaki pants and this football jersey that I had taken from high school. <laughs> yeah. Now that this is public, people and friends are going to be like, oh, no, he still has our jersey. Uh, and um, actually, don't still have it. We were talking about training. And I was just, you know, talking stuff. So he said, uh, what do you think about training? And I said, oh, you don't need training to be an actor. You just learn as you go. Even though in my head I was learning that the bigger my roles got, the more I kind of got lost if I didn't have a good director or if the script wasn't good. Mm -hmm. So um, I said, you know, I want to go to the actor studio because that's all I knew. I said, I just Mm want to go to New York and go to the actor studio. Mm -hmm. And I said, said, the only other place I'd even consider is Yale. And I couldn't get into Yale anyway because I didn't finish my undergraduate degree. And I, once again, I'm just talking BS. I just say, and the only reason I said that was because of Meryl Streep, because that's the only thing I knew about Yale, was Meryl Streep. So uh-huh. I just say it. And he says to me, well, <laughs> you might want to consider Yale because I got my master's in painting from Yale, and I don't have a, an undergraduate degree because I went to diploma school. So I don't know why him saying that got in my head, mm-hmm. but it did. And the next day I called information, I got the number for the drama school, and I asked him. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they said, um, yeah, you can apply as a certificate student. And if you get in, you can go through the program as a certificate student. And then if you ever do get your bachelor's degree, all you have to do is send us proof of you have a bachelor's and we'll convert it to a master's. So I was like, wow, okay. So, I mean, once again, even as I applied, I'm thinking, I don't really, you know, my history with school was not one of enjoyment. So I don't, you know, know why I'm really applying. And then, uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 first of all, you only needed one recommend, even though it was the exact same program, as a certificate student, you didn't need to send in your grades, <laughs> and uh-huh. you only needed one recommendation. Uh-huh. So I got a, a really mediocre recommendation, and I got a stellar recommendation, so I threw the bad one out, and I sent it in, <laughs> then I got an audition, and I remember going to the audition on a, I was in a, I was in a play at the time, and I then managed to get an audition on a weekend uh, before we were in performances, and... There was, a, there was a young lady that I knew from Boston, and she said to me, um, Lance, oh, it's great to see you. What do you, uh, uh, where else you, you know, where else have you auditioned? I said, well, uh, no place. She said, oh, you're trying that out here first? And I said, yeah. She said, uh, well, where else did you apply? And I, I'm thinking, <laughs> well, and I didn't want to say it, but I said, well, no right. place. And she yeah. looked at me like I had 10 heads. Yeah. Uh, 
And so, you know, I did my audition. I, I, I did well. Uh, and then I kind of forgot about it. And a month later, uh, uh, my wife at the time had come, was in Boston, and we were living in Gloucester at the time, which was about a 45-minute drive up the coast. So <clears throat> we're driving, and we're halfway, up, we're halfway home. She said, oh, Lance, by the way, you got a, a letter from Yale. I said, really? She said, yeah. And she pulls out this thin letter. Something it's thin. It means I didn't get in. Yeah. She said, you want me to open? I said, oh, screw it, just open it. She said, uh, Mr. Reddick, we're pleased to inform you, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what? She said, Lance, you got in. <laughs> and I was, sh I, 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 it was like, it was a little disconnect. Like it wasn't real, like I was dreaming or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I once got a thin letter from Yale Law, uh, uh, and it was not to say that I was in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the normal thing. I, again, you, you got this really amazing life story. That's partly why I want to talk about it. Of, of And you, you, you might be the only guy in the country who applied to Yale and then forgot about it. Uh, and then get sick. I wasn't even sure I wanted to go. You know, go. Right, and no, then when I, I got know, in, it was I like know. I had to ask everybody their opinion. Yeah. So, and, and look, when I went to Columbia Law, there was a lot of people from different backgrounds. There was an opera singer, there was a Marine, et cetera. And so they probably loved your, your experience uh, more than, you know, obviously the grades, et cetera. And, and, and obviously you uh, must have. Kill that audition, even though uh, I mean I did do well. I have right. to say, when I, in the, my interview after the audition, he asked me why I didn't finish my undergrad, and I said because I didn't want to do that anymore. And he got this look on his face. Earl, who was the chairman of the acting department at the time, he had a voice box because he had a, yeah. uh, excuse me, uh, uh -huh. and uh, he said, "Why did you quit? Why did yeah. you finish?" And I told him, I you know I didn't realize I didn't want to do that anymore. He said, "How many credits did you need to finish?" And I said, "Well." I just needed to do another semester composition. I really had more than enough credits to finish. And he said, and you didn't want to? I said, no, it goes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I just blew it. I quit a lot of jobs before I, uh, I found the one <laughs> I like. And and so, look, part of the reason that we do the, that we do these kind of interviews, and I'm spending so much time even before we get to your acting career, which is what you're known for, is because I, I want people to know it's it's tough times, but that it's things are still possible, right? And and the and the right way to get to the places that you need to go, and and that if you don't get discouraged, sometimes a back injury is the best thing that could ever happen to you, and sometimes things you didn't expect turn out to be wonderful, etc. And so you didn't have any advantages, growing. You weren't a legacy student at Yale. Well, no, I wasn't a legacy. <laughs> but I will say this, because this, you know, because I, I think about this a lot about where class and race um, um, diverge and where they dovetail. Yeah. And I've definitely, even I mean, even throughout my career, I've definitely had disadvantages because of race. But um, I've had advantages because of class. Not necessarily, you know, because my parents were city, you know, they both worked for the state. But um, my mother was a school teacher and my dad was a public defender. But he was an attorney and my mom had a, had a master's degree from Columbia. <laughs> around uh -huh. there. You know, so uh, they were very well educated. And they sent me to the best schools. So the people that I was, you know, so there was, uh, there was, um, there was, uh, I grew up in an environment of uh, intellectual curiosity and, and a belief that whatever you believed and worked hard for and, and figured out was possible. So I feel like in that regard, psychologically, uh, it, it, it gave me an advantage, if you know what I mean. I do, absolutely. Look, I, we talked a lot about it on the show and real quick, and then I really wanna get to the wire and, and all the other things uh, that you wound up doing. Uh, so, Jesus Godoy, who's been our director for 15 years, I had a conversation with him a bunch of years ago uh, that was really eye opening for me. He said, Look, I grew up in East LA, and uh, the thing that we aspired to was to be the guy that climbs the electric poles because he gets paid the highest at the electric company, right? We didn't know that you could go to Harvard and Yale. We just didn't know. Nobody told us, right? And so that's why, that, in a sense, that class culture. Makes such a big difference, yeah. and that's why your mom knew that and and sent you to the best schools, etc. Uh, and, and also, she just grew up in a. I mean, she had twelve brothers and sisters. I mean, she grew up uh, a decade before the depression hit, and uh, they all went to college, and all of them graduated except one, because that's just what they were. It was that just what they was right. And, and it does make look it, nowadays. Of course, culture uh, college is nearly un unaffordable, yeah. but uh, yeah. but at the same time, it makes a giant difference. So. Uh, did, do you think that you, going to Yale helped in getting some of those acting jobs? Absolutely, two, for two reasons. One, <clears throat> one of the things at Yale affords you is access to cast, casting directors and um, and producers right off the bat. You do something called league scenes, which is which are audition scenes, basically for the industry when you get out. So that's one thing. Uh, 
second, especially at the time that I got out, because there were so many great actors that came from Yale. I mean, not just Mel Street, John Turturro, Tony Shalhoub. I mean, Leah Shriver was two years ahead of me. Paul Giamatti was in my class. Oh, um, really? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, awesome. uh, uh, um, um, Charles Dutton... Uh, um, Angela Bassett and uh, um, Jodie Foster. Didn't she? Go well, no, there? she was an undergraduate. Oh, she was an undergraduate. Okay. But um, uh, th three of those guys were in the same class at the drama school. Wow. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, uh, what what did you perceive as your first big break in acting? My first big break. I mean, I was fortunate from the beginning. I mean, I was understudying on Broadway two weeks after I graduated. So it's well, a pretty um, good break right there. And I, I went from that to a, an off-Broadway show that ran for a year. So, um, but if I would say a big break, my big break, I would say would be Oz. There was so, definitely a before and after. Oz was, it's, it's kind of interesting because it, it was, I argue that it's a, a legendary TV show, uh, but it was before the golden era of HBO. It was like the very beginning of the golden was, era of HBO. I think HBO. it was the first successful dramatic series. That's right. Yeah. And so, Everybody who cared about it, so now everybody watches Game of Thrones, for example, yeah. and it gets better ratings than than the networks do. But back it's, it's then- It's crazy how that's changed. That's right, but yeah. back then, it, Oz was only followed by a group of people that really cared about dramas and loved yeah. TV and et cetera. But it was all the right people in a sense, like people that were interested yes. in yeah. television. Yeah. So my yeah. guess is that not only did people like me who are not the right people, <laughs> right, but people that are in the acting community, Probably watch that more so than well, others. I remember doing while I, I think it was the following year. Yeah, it was the following year. It was, it was a, a few months before I got cast in the wire. I got a guest spot on Law and Order, and I remember. Oh my, why can't I think of his name? Uh, I played a cop, uh, incredible singer. He was in Rent. He plays his dad on the Flash. On Flash now. Um, anyway, I was in a makeup chair, and he came up to me, and he said. Uh, Hey man, love John Oz. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, and for whatever it's worth, all my friends uh, watched Oz, and and it was it was drama for guys. Uh, and yeah, um, yeah. so, anyways, uh, did when you eventually got the job on the wire, did you sense that it was like when you got the first script, etc.? Did you sense that this was going to be a show that some would consider the best show ever made? Specifically, what you asked, no. However, it's the only pilot I've ever read that I felt like I have to be on the show. Mm -hmm. I have to be on the show. And I didn't even want to know what role to play because, first of all, it read like the first chapter of a novel. Mm -hmm. And the only role that really was clearly prominent was McNulty. All the other roles, I mean, you couldn't tell how big they were. I didn't even realize I was a second lead until I got on set and saw the, the call sheet my first day on the pilot. Uh -huh. um, and <laughs> plus, it's a role that uh, they wouldn't see me for at first. They wouldn't see me for Daniels at first. You auditioned for other roles too. I auditioned right? for Bunk three times. Uh -huh. My last uh, time in for Bunk uh, was the first time that I auditioned for David and um, for David and Ed. Uh, for that, I mean, I'd worked with David and Ed two years early on the corner, uh, and David asked me to read Bubbles on the spot, uh -huh. and that ended up being second choice for Bubbles. Because David knew me, because I played a crackhead on the corner, and then in mm -hmm. Oz I played a, uh, a heroin addict. So he's right. like, he'd be a great drug addict. <laughs> That's a good thing you didn't get typecast in that role, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was good to break out. Yeah. So um, I, I want to see show you a scene from Bosch, so we can catch up to today, okay? And then uh, and talk about that too. So let's go to Bosch for a second. Did you know about this? First I've heard of it. I haven't even seen a one twenty eight. Should I be worried, sir? It was a long time ago. You were a new D one. Anything you might have done or not done, you now wish you'd done differently. I've made my share of mistakes, but not on this case. This was done by the numbers, start to finish. The DA would say, of course you'd say that. You've got a lot to lose. I don't care about that. I'm concerned about the victim's family. Justice was done, I don't want to see it undone. You got my back on this one, right, Chief? 100%. Okay, um, are you uh, so you went from crackhead uh, typecasting to uh, police chief typecasting? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> let me ask you a really funny question: Are you happy with your acting career? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on the day. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of those actors that was, uh, to be honest. 
from the time I got out of school, I was always kind of cocky about how good I was. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I never kind of went away. So, um, and so with the um, kind of the limits that I, the kind of glass ceiling I feel like I've run into very often in terms of race, um, um, sometimes I get frustrated. But by the same token, I mean, I mean, I'm on two great shows right now, and I've got three great movies coming out this year. I mean, what am I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> right. And they're, right. Great, and they're great roles in two great shows. Yeah. Bosch and Corporate. That's right. That's right. And yeah. the three movies are John Wick Chapter 3. John Wick Chapter 3, uh, Angel Has Fallen, and um, Little Woods. Right. No, so, I mean, look, I, I'm thrilled to have you in here uh, because you're in so many of the shows that I watch and absolutely loved. And so, yeah, I view you as an enormous actor, right? And, uh, and certainly one that's influential in my life. Um, but I see what you're saying about the glass ceiling. And so what's your sense of that as, as an African-American actor? Is it, the, is it that there's only really basically a couple of times you got a shot at lead actor in a massive major motion picture? I mean, I would get, once or twice a year, I would get like a, 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 an audition for a cattle, a cattle call you know, early in my career. But it was, but now that I look back, it was like I was never gonna get that. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, because so much of it um, depends on kind of who represents you and where you're stati- you know, where you are in the pecking order. Um, but so, just for example, um, you know, before I before I uh, signed off for Bosch, uh, that pilot season, um, as far as I was concerned, there was nothing for me. I mean, I got called in for meetings for a couple of uh, cops that I didn't want to do. Uh, even ba- even Bosch, before I found out who it was coming from, I said, "No, I don't want to do that." <laughs> do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, but the op- so f- even the opportunities to audition for like the leads in in TV shows, um, I mean, they just haven't they just haven't been there. Yeah. So do you feel a little bit better now that uh, given Black Panther and Us and oh, the it's, outstanding it's, success it's, it's of com- African American It's completely. Leads. Ch- I mean, I feel like the landscape is changing. Has changed so much just in the last five years. It's it's a little. Um, I mean, still, you know, the the industry. It's, it's still trying to hold on to that the, the kind of the, the the culture of tokenism. Of there's only mm-hmm. one at a time, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, I'm really. Uh, I don't want to say hopeful, um, but I Go guess for it. Be hopeful. But I guess that's the most accurate way I could put it. Um, I'm really hopeful, and not just for me personally, but um, for the, the diversity of representation because it's really important. I mean, it's something you said earlier about um, about uh, LA being a cultural hub and how you know there was um, the representation matters. I, I'm always I'm always reminded of the story that um, my wife told me of, of a very uh, someone close to her when their son was uh, about five years old. Um, he grew up in um, in northern Minnesota, around no people of color. So what he knew was what was on TV. They're in a McDonald's and there's a black guy there, and he walks up to the guy and says, "Are you a bad guy?" Wow. So I mean, as far as I'm concerned, those images matter. It's never just entertainment. Never. Yeah, and and so I had a conversation very similar to this, but uh, with someone that works. Or worked for us, uh, Eric Byler, and and he's a wonderful progressive like you are, uh, and he's mixed race, uh, half Asian, half white. I uh, grew up in Hawaii, and and when he came to the mainland, he realized that a, a stereotype had been implanted in his brain about uh, black people. And then we had a conversation about where did that come from, because he's a good guy, does had no bad intent, but realized that he was making assumptions about black people. He was realized he was crossing the other side of the street when he saw uh, black folks in the street, and we realized it goes uh, both ways too. Yeah, how is how so? The first time I realized it was well, it was twenty years ago. I was in Minneapolis. I was doing a play, and it was the dead of winter. It was uh, the end of January, beginning of February. We were in rehearsals, and so I would. Uh, they had two really great um, art movie houses. <clears throat> So I, it was about a half an hour walk to the, to the uh, theaters. So I would walk and go to a movie and then walk home late at night. And so one night I was walking. This happened more than once. I'm walking. This, it's, it's barren. It's after midnight. And I'm bundled up because it's like 
10 degrees, and I got a hoodie on and a hat on, you know? And there's a white woman coming toward me, and I keep expecting her to cross the street. She doesn't. And as she comes by me, she looks me right in the face and says, hi. And my initial thought is, what's wrong with you? Huh. Because I was so conditioned to expect that a white woman, especially in that kind of setting, would be afraid of me. It's just, it was just, oh, it was just wow. expected. Wow, that, I mean. Guys, and then it happened, it happened more than once. If you're not black, just think for a second about how it feels to be black when you're expecting that people are going to be afraid of you at all times. And I'm somebody who grew up mostly around white people. Yeah, no, no, it's, and so to, uh, to get back to Eric, he said, I realized that that ha image, that stereotype that I didn't want in my brain was implanted there by the media, by local news overhyping and sensationalizing crimes done by minorities because it got better ratings, by TV shows, by uh, movies, and we were conditioned to think black people were bad guys or criminals, etc. And so in a, in a sense, so media is all powerful and because it sets the culture. Yeah. And so it can poison the world, uh, but it could also unpoison the world. Yeah. And so now we live in an era of Black Panther, etc. And now all of a sudden we got white right wingers complaining with the story we did last week, saying, "Now are all the lead roles going to go to black guys?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting too because when when the wire was on, it was the cliche was the greatest show nobody's watching because nobody, you know, I would remember uh, when I first moved to LA, I was, I, uh, I was uh, in conversation with a, a manager, <clears throat> about possibly about him representing me. And when I went in to meet him, he's black. And, he, and I talked to him about The Wire and he said, you know, I, I, I can't understand it. I cannot get my white colleagues to watch that show. Hmm. I mean, that's the, interesting. Uh, well, for all of us who did, um, well, no, the country, it didn't by word of through no, word no, of mouth, I don't it mean, into a yeah, worldwide as, phenomenon. As, yeah, I, I don't mean as white people because uh, it's very questionable what I am. <laughs> but but these days, uh, people aren't putting me in the white category. Uh, but uh, but as everybody who watched it loved it so much that I think that word of mouth wound up just spreading and spreading and spreading, and it to this day it still spreads. To this yeah. day, people have started watching The Wire. I don't know how many people still yeah. come up to me who say I've just started watching it, or I'm watching yeah. it for the third time. Yeah, yeah. And That's so many, so many uh, opportunities are coming to me from young, from young white guys, young millennials who grew up with a, who grew up with The Wire and who grew up with hip hop, who have a different conception of race, who who don't see me as a black guy but see me as that guy. Do you know, it's just yeah. see me as a guy. Yeah. Ah, uh, I think. Look, I'm hopeful. I'll use the word. Uh, I think that it, we're in super dark times in the era of Trump, et cetera, but but I can see the light, uh, and I and I think that uh, you know history has its ups and downs. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but I, I do I believe uh, Martin Luther King. I really do that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, and we're beginning. I'm more skeptical than you are, but uh, I hear you. <laughs> but we're beginning to see it bend, and so um, I'm super hopeful about it. And you're a part of that, Lance. So thank you for Thanks. joining us. Appreciate it. Thank All you. right, wonderful. Um, okay, uh, and and everybody remember, of course, Bosch starts on April nineteenth. Okay, now apparently there's a thousand different ways to watch Lance this year, <laughs> but this is one of them. So check it out; it's on Prime Video. Uh, and thank you for joining us; we appreciate it. The TYT Plus app is now available on iOS and Android. Download to get more TYT content at tyt.com/app.